Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in a manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Lauren LaPuma. And I'm Liza Lester. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. Hey, Lauren. Hey, Liza. How's the quarantine bubble? You know, it's it's a little tough these days, I must say. We're now, what, four months in? I know. It's like, what is time? Time doesn't matter. <laughs> I feel like we're just living the same day over and over again. <laughs> it does feel that way. <laughs> but you know, Liza, I actually talked to a scientist recently who gave me a little bit of hope. I felt I feel a little bit reassured. I like hope. Yeah, that we, that we will get through this and things will be okay. Well... So who's this person? So I talked to Alex Moore, who's a scientist at the Climate Change Institute and also a professor at Long Island University. And he researches climate and pandemics. Oh, no. (laughs) So timely. (laughs) Very timely. Very timely. So Alex actually did some work recently on the Spanish flu pandemic that happened right during and after World War I. Oh, like... 100 years ago. Yeah. Everyone's talking about how that was like the last big mess like this that we got ourselves into. It was. It was. It's been a long time. So he's going to tell us a little bit about how we can be hopeful. Yes. (laughs) My name is Alexander Moore. I'm a professor of uh, uh, environmental health at Long Island University in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm trained as both a historian and a scientist. What we do is, what I do personally, we have multiple initiatives within the project, but what I do uh, is look at the impact of climate change on people's health and the economy and the impact of people on climate and the environment. Our data essentially comes from historical, archaeological fields as well as scientific fields. Uh, So we use I-score data, which is the gold standard of climate science, and we have the highest resolution climate record ever produced. So I can tell you what the atmosphere looks like for any day for the last 2,000 years. So how is climate involved in the Spanish flu in World War I? Well, actually, it's interesting. So if you go back and look at photos of World War I or you know historical accounts of it, people in Europe talked about how rainy it was. It was super rainy. The trenches filled with rain. A lot of people got sick from it. And so what Alex has done in a recent study is they went back and looked at climate data from an ice core that they took from the Alps. So it recorded you know climate in Europe over the past several thousand years. And as Alex said, you know, they can they have enough data points that they can tell you what the atmosphere looked like any day for the past 2000 years. Wow. Yeah. And so during World War One, they found that there was actually a slight a change in the climate during the period of the war. And then that may have affected how the virus, the, the flu virus was transmitted to people. Oh, no, that's so unlucky. Yeah. So, you know, in the Spanish flu pandemic, people don't know exactly where the virus originated from, but they think that in Europe it was transferred to humans via uh, mallard ducks. Ducks. Yes. I did not know that Your ducks- friendly neighborhood <laughs> duck was the reservoir of the virus. Yes. Apparently mallard ducks are a big reservoir of flu viruses. I did not know that. So from 1914 to 1918, 20, we've noticed that atmospheric circulation changed and there was much more precipitation, much more rain, much colder weather all over Europe for six years. And what does that do to people's health? How does that affect diseases? How does that affect populations of animals that carry those diseases? The Spanish flu was an avian flu, H1N1. So how does that anomaly affect migration patterns of ducks, for example, which are the main uh, vector of these diseases? And because this is big data, we look at anomalies first. And this is what all climate scientists do, really. Environmental scientists look at anomalies. Anomalies are easy to spot. In uh, this particular case, it was a 100-year anomaly, that is, an anomaly that you've never see, that you don't see for 100 years the biggest peaks in in this case sodium and chlorine 
uh, which are the components of sea salt, uh, the highest peaks on in a 100-year period occur between 1914 and 1920, the years of World War I. And what does that mean? We all went into the books and the photographs, and the, it's not very difficult for World War I. And you will find, even if you just Google rain plus World War I, you will see all of the photographs and the testimonies of people that for years and years said that the war was hampered, I mean, the war effort was hampered by rivers of mud, lakes of mud, the constant rain, the constant cold that extended into summers, even as far as Turkey, the Battle of Gallipoli, the campaign at Gallipoli, where the Australian and New Zealand troops uh, suffered so much. And there are poems about this uh, one by uh, uh, a woman, and she called uh, the Somme the liquid grave of our armies uh, because it was a field of mud. Artillery was drowned in it. People drowned in it. Horses drowned in it. The trenches were full of water. People had water up to their, their chest. Sometimes the, the tunnels that were dug underneath the fields in order to reach the other side and infiltrate the other side flooded with water, and everybody died in those tunnels as well. They developed uh-huh. all sorts of other diseases and uh, pneumococcal infections, as well as trench foot, as well as all sorts of really gnarly war diseases. And this absolutely increased mortality. Concurrently, you have this climate anomaly affecting wildlife. So mallard ducks, which are the main uh, vector of H1N1, avian flu virus, reach 60% infection among juveniles. 60% of of, of little baby, baby ducklings have H1N1 in Europe in the fall, every fall. The main way ducks transfer the disease to other mammals, water. It's through uh, fecal droppings in water. Uh, the mallards have been shown to uh, be uh, very sensitive to climate anomalies in their migration patterns. So the likelihood is that uh, they stayed put for the entire period uh, and they didn't actually move. All migration studies of mallards show that uh, the slightest change in environmental or even position in their lives affects their direction. They actually basically stay put. So Um, where do they normally migrate to in Europe then? The literature I've read, a scientific literature I've read, show a pattern that goes from Europe to Russia in a northeast, southwest, back and forth pattern based on the seasons. So warmer seasons, they go north, colder seasons, they go south, uh, west. The patterns that we're seeing, we've seen in this case in Europe for the war years, most likely caused the ducks to say exactly where they were. As historians, we know, and as anybody who works on, on a situation like a pandemic, you can take again the COVID-19 pandemic, To understand the situation, it's important that we assume that our reality is not the product of one factor. Everything has multiple causes. So it wasn't just the ducks. It wasn't just the weather. It wasn't just the historian Humphreys carefully, carefully tracked the outbreaks across the globe to understand the transmission pattern from uh, different places eventually to Europe and North America. And uh, it seems to be associated with laborers hired by the allies from Asia who passed it to North America and Canada in particular, and, and also the United States and eventually to Europe as well. Do you know what the cause was of this climate anomaly? Or was it just kind of a natural variation? Or was it was there a cause to it? 
and uh, we did not identify a an external cause except uh, atmospheric reorganization where the Icelandic low pressure system, which is this cold system north of Europe, which kind of sits over Iceland, became dominant over the European continent for five years. These atmospheric reorganizations happen and they affect people. They affect the environment. They affect how much, what we can eat. They affect how we dress. They affect how we move, migrations, uh, how much water is available, uh, what animals are around. Animals re- follow just like us, they follow food. And with animals come diseases, as uh, bats have shown, or civets, or snakes, whoever we think was the culprit for COVID-19. And the same goes for mallard ducks and H1N1, if in fact it was the mallards. Animals follow, bring their own disease environment with them in their migration, and their migrations are due to the environment. You know, when I... This, during this whole story, I just the most surprising thing to me was the ducks. Me too. Like I, you, you don't think about ducks as being reservoirs of disease. No, you think like I don't know, pigs and chickens and bats, monkeys. Yeah, ducks. They <laughs> seem so innocent. But you know, Alex has actually done some other work on different pandemics, and one other thing we talked about was about his work on the Black Death. So the Black Death also had a climate component? It did a little bit, but this is actually kind of different, whereas his work on the Spanish flu was more how climate exacerbated the pandemic. This is how the the Black Death pandemic changed the climate and specifically changed pollution. So... Oh, <laughs> but in a good way. Well, well, in a good way, but for a bad reason, because the Black Death was so deadly, um, numbers people estimate that at least 40 percent of the population of europe died in the 1300s during this one particular wave of the black death that industry basically stopped and at the time people were smelting and mining metals particularly lead and so all that stopped and so all the pollution that we were creating during this time just went to zero so the black death pandemic by death rate is the largest pandemic in recorded history that we know of, at least. What I mean by death rate is we have a death rate of 40 to 60 percent of Europe and Eurasia. In fact, it's Europe and Asia, North Africa as well. We're concerned about death rates that are uh, now with COVID going between 1 percent in Korea, South Korea, and 10 to 15 percent in Italy, Europe. Uh, imagine 40, imagine 60. Uh, it means that more, you know, half of your population drops. It just disappears from, from a city, from anywhere. So in the Black, during the Black Death, uh, well, in the 1300s, for a decade between 1315 and 1325, there was a climate anomaly that we know as the Great Famine which caused widespread famines and bad harvests all throughout Europe. So people were weakened by multiple famines uh, all throughout Europe. And then in 1346, there is news of a new plague, of new disease coming from the East, starts in the Black Sea and then makes its way East. Uh, lands in uh, Sicily in 1347, and then Genoa also. And by 1348, it's pretty much everywhere. It reaches England in the same year uh, and really spreads in 1349, and it kills 40 to 60% of people. It's a version, um, we know for a fact, that this was a strain of plague. It's a bacterium known as Yersinia pestis after Alexandre Yersin, who was a, a scientist from the Institut Pasteur of Paris, who discovered it in the late 1800s in uh, Southeast Asia. 
This bacterium causes a very nasty infection. In fact, it, it causes three different kinds of infections. Pneumonic or uh, bubonic or septicemic plague. The septicemic and pneumonic are very lethal, uh, whereas uh, the bubonic creates these buboes in your neck, in your oh, wherever you have lymph glands. So your neck here, where you have your tonsils, under your arms, and also in the groin. And these buboes become, the word is carbuncles. They become dark and black, and that's why it's called the Black Death. That's where the name comes from. This disease spread very quickly. Its incubation and because of its the, the, the way that it's transported, usually by rats carrying fleas that are infected with it. The, the incubation period and the, its whole life cycle, which I'm not going to go into details of, really allowed it to spread very efficiently throughout pre-modern Europe because uh, it, the, the incubation and, the, and all of the other factors matched travel, travel times especially by, by land, but also by sea, where rats... Uh, you know, love to to travel on by boat. Uh, they love, especially grain ships. They love grain, and grain was the staple of uh, Europe for the diet of Europe for two thousand years. And the fleas then jumped from them to humans, often living exactly in the same quarters, and humans get infected. The disease progressed throughout Europe, and we had a standstill of the economy. You had a collapse of the economy throughout Europe at this time. Uh, when you have 40 to 60 percent of the population die, uh, most of commercial and industrial activities cease. They stop. Uh, one of the first ones to stop was a very poorly paid activity of uh, mining lead. So all mines in Europe stopped at this time, but particularly the ones in in Great Britain, and we uh, went and documented the arrival of the plague and the interruption of the production of lead precisely to the month and day. And concurrently, we saw pollution levels of lead drop to zero for the only time in the 2,000-year record for five years. There is no other time in 2,000 years of data that we have, there's no other time when lead dropped to such low levels. When you do that, you can see what the impact of a historical event, like a pandemic, was on the atmosphere. Just like this past couple of months, we've seen how the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic has decreased the pollution worldwide, in particular in China, in Northern Italy. And this has been captured by satellites. It's been captured by land-based instruments, anything that we have now. But, you know, 700 years ago, there were no satellites or land-based instruments. So we actually saw what we're seeing now seven, happening 700 years ago. And at the time, before COVID, uh, we did not know that that was something that happened. This was not an established paradigm in science or literature. We didn't really know that pandemics affected pollution, affected the atmosphere to that level. In fact, the assumption that there always was from all regulation agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency, the United Nations Environment Program, WHO, they all based their uh, pollution standards on whatever the level was before the Industrial Revolution, meaning 1850 or so. And they assumed that because there was no industry, there was no pollution. Guess what? There was a lot of pollution even before industry because we've been around for a long time and we've been smelting toxic metals for a long time. We've been polluting the air for a long time with coal, with other biomass, uh, that is any wood, any coal. So uh, what our study found was that during a pandemic, pollution levels went to undetectable level, to zero, levels to zero essentially. And why is that important? Because it's the baseline. It's the baseline for health. For five years, the pollution fell, dropped to zero, and there was no other event matching it anywhere else. So pollution dro dropped for five years, not just one year, not just two years, five during the pandemic, just like it has uh, during the COVID pandemic. 
uh, what this did to Europe, to people, to the environment is uh, enormous. I mean, the collapse of the economy, the collapse of population brought a completely new economic system. So uh, rents dropped and pay went up, right? Wages went up because for the first time we had labor laws. The first labor laws in Western Europe start in this period because there are so few people who can work that they say, you want to pay me $5 an hour? No way. 15 or nothing. And so you have uh, you have people being paid uh, three times or four times more than uh, they used to be paid for the same job. And they have a choice of what job they can they can take instead of having to take the old uh, difficult jobs, dangerous jobs like mining or smelting. We have, it's really a reorganization of the entire life of the continent, not unlike what we are experiencing today. And as a climate historian and scientist, and as a person who's very much concerned about uh, man-made climate change and the crisis we're experiencing, which hasn't stopped uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, I look at this opportunity now, at this, I mean, I look at this crisis now as an opportunity to think, well, what can we do differently? Because this is what, what they did during the, the last great pandemic before the Spanish flu, the Black Death. The economy was reorganized uh, more fairly for many people. So why, how can we do that to reorganize our economy more fairly for the environment and ourselves because we are part of it? One thing that my environmental and, and historical and public health research really helps with in general is the reassurance that I get from my information, from my data, from my evidence that we've overcome things like these before and how we have overcome them and what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, a lot of trial and error has been done already by our predecessors. Social distancing existed in the Spanish flu epidemic, pandemic. Uh, it existed in the Black Death. To me, all of these stories, all of these, all of this evidence is incredibly reassuring because I know that we've overcome it before. Uh, masks were invented, you know, the, the Dr. Plague mask that you see with the big nose was invented for the, the ongoing waves of the Black Death of, of, of plague. Uh, and we are having a nas- nationwide, global, really, um, debate about masks today and what's the best design and how do we do it's always the same story so this this covid situation is new to all of us alive now but humanity's been through this before we've been through before and been through it a lot and a lot worse oh, yeah I mean, it just makes me think about how past generations just had to deal with this all the time. It must have been really scary. Yeah, before antibiotics, before vaccines, it, see this disease coming for you and what could you do? Yeah, not much. Get away, pretty much. <laughs> Social distancing was maybe the only thing people could do for a long time. Return to the old ways. Yes. <laughs> Wisdom of the past. <laughs> so as much as we... we hate our situation now or as much as we complain it will get better and we've been through it all right folks that's all from third pod from the sun thanks to lauren for bringing us this story and to alex for sharing his work with us this episode was produced and mixed by me HU would love to hear your thoughts please rate and review this podcast and you can find new episodes of your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com thanks and we'll see you next time